What a beautiful opportunity for us to reflect on the coming Savior who is going to die on the cross for our sins. And this morning, I just want to encourage you and in posture of gratitude and thanksgiving just to offer up a sacrifice of praise for all that he has done, for his love that he demonstrated for us. Yeah. 
right, church, let's turn our attention over here to the baptism. Good morning, church. This is Katie, and she is one of our preteens here at Christ Church. And I can't tell you what a privilege it's been to watch Katie grow up the past four years, not only in her life, but in her faith. I've watched and served along her family and her, and she has chosen today to follow Jesus. And so when the world is telling this generation to go one way, you're, you're getting to see hope. That, that we're having a generation raise up to follow Jesus. So I'm going to ask Katie that you repeat after me. Church, I'm going to ask you to do the same as well. So, ready? I believe, I believe that Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus is the Christ. The Son of the living God. The Son of the living God. My Lord. My Lord. My Savior. My Savior. Katie, based on the confession of your sins and the profession of your faith, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Son. Holy Spirit. And forgiveness of your sins. Oh, that's a great way to get our morning started. Go ahead and grab a seat, church family. It's just amazing watching what God is doing in the lives of our kids and our students. It's fun to see some of our, uh, our preteens making decisions for Jesus and being baptized. That's a great morning. Well, this is also a special morning uh, because it is Palm Sunday. It's the beginning of the Passion Week. And as the Bible records in Mark chapter 11, verse 6, it says, They said what Jesus had told them to say, talking about his disciples, and they did what Jesus told them to do. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their garments over it, and he sat on it. Many in the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him, and others spread leafy branches they had cut in the fields. Jesus was the center of the procession, and the people all around him were shouting, Praise God! Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessings on the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Praise God in the highest heaven. And I love what it says in the middle of that passage that Jesus was the center of it all. And Jesus is the center of it all. And this week, as we move into the Passion Week, I wanna encourage you to make sure that you do make Jesus the center of everything. And we've got a few things around here to help you with that. We kicked off uh, devotionals this morning. If you jump online on our website, our app, you can find uh, devotionals from our team just sharing with you what Jesus was doing every step of the way leading to the cross and ultimately leading to the empty tomb that we're gonna celebrate next weekend. There's several other things going on this week I wanna make you aware of. Uh, we start on Thursday, our, our Stations of the Cross lake here at the Mandarin campus. And so I want to encourage you to, if you have some time on Thursday evening or maybe Friday before the Good Friday service or afterwards, or maybe Saturday morning, if you just want to head up here and, and just walk through the stations of the cross. Again, to just make sure that Jesus is the center of everything. And, and the stations of the cross will help you understand every step that Jesus took ultimately to the cross for you and for me. And of course, we have our Good Friday service at noon on, on Good Friday, uh, this coming Friday. And then we kick off our Easter services. We're going to be inside this year. And so we're going to start on Saturday at 4 p.m. and then Sunday morning on the lake at 7 a.m. and then back in here at 9 and 11 a.m. So 9.30 crowd, make sure you remember it's not 9.30 next week. It's at 9 o'clock. And we're going to just have an incredible time coming to, together to celebrate his, not just his death, but his resurrection the hope that we have in Jesus. So make sure if you haven't invited somebody yet, you can still on your way out, you can grab some of the invitation cards and you can bring somebody with you to church next weekend as we jump into an exciting season. And so one of the things we've been talking about around here a little bit is marriage. And marriage is a big part of our rooted initiative and what we're looking to do for the next 50 years around here at Christ Church. And so I wanna share something with you. It's kind of a bounce back after our Easter services. On Friday, April the 12th, we're gonna have a special marriage night. It's going to be a fun time in here together. I uh, invited my friend Steve Weatherford and his wife uh, to come and share a little bit of their story. You might remember Steve was here about a year and a half ago. He's uh, uh, played in the NFL, won a Super Bowl with the Giants. Uh, he's going to be back with his wife, Laura, and they're going to just share their testimony and what they've learned about having a marriage that is thriving. And so I want to encourage you to come and hang out with us for that. You can find information online and you can sign up to be a part of that amazing evening. Well, we are close to wrapping up the book of Genesis. Now, as we started this a year and a half ago, I guarantee none of us thought we would, we would literally walk all the way through to take over a year to get there, but we're close. And so today I'm really excited. Greg's gonna kind of bring things almost to the end. 
and we're going to end on Easter Sunday next Sunday, but Greg's going to uh, bring things pretty close to the end of today as we continue through the book of Genesis. So let me pray as we get ready to jump into the word of God. Jesus, we thank you because you are the center of everything. We thank you for the way you love us. We thank you for the way you came for us. We thank you for the sacrifice that you made for us. But Jesus, we also thank you because we know that tomb is empty. And so as we come together this week, make sure that, that Jesus, we make you the center of everything. And I pray today as we jump into the final chapters of the book of Genesis, that uh, the lessons that we've been learning will not just be things that we've learned, but things that we do and apply. And so would you be with Greg today as he brings the word of God. We love you, Jesus. We need you. Speak to us today. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Shrouded in darkness, chaos is all we see. Violence, oppression, and destruction surround us. No matter how dark the situation becomes, we are reminded of these two words, but God. But God won't let our hearts be troubled. The storm is raging on, but God will calm the sea. The enemy is attacking, but God will overcome. In this life, we will have many tribulations, but God will have the last word. God is not done. Well, good morning. If for, for years, uh, for really the last decade of my life, I lived in South Florida near Biscayne Bay. And if you've ever been there, it's this beautiful body of water that runs uh, around the southeast side of the state of Florida. And one of the things that I always loved, because I would drive right by the bay every single day, is you could look out right into the bay and what would you see? You would see boats. Thousands and thousands and thousands of boats. And yeah, there were marinas and there were docks, but there were these buoys, these mooring buoys, and on these buoys would just be thousands and thousands and thousands of boats. It seemed like you could just frogger yourself across the boats. Now, what is a buoy, right? It's this, it's this floating buoy, right, that had this heavy chain, and at the bottom of the chain, at the bottom of the ocean in the water was this anchor, and the anchor, right, the idea of this anchor is that the tides would come in and out, the water levels would change, the currents would change, the winds would change, and storms would come. But the idea of this anchor is that the boat would sway and the boat would move and the boat would drift, but the boat would stay secure because of the anchor. The anchor is firm and secure. And so let me ask you a question this morning. What is your anchor? Like what is that thing, that rock, that one thing that holds you firm and secure? Because the waves of life are gonna come, the tides are gonna change, the currents are gonna change, storms are going to happen. It is a reality of being human. The storms of life will come. What is it that is your anchor? What is your anchor? For some in this room, it's maybe it's your spouse or a family member. Your, your mom was your rock or your dad was your rock. Maybe for you, it's financial security. That there's enough margin in the, in the bank for a, for a rainy day. You have your rainy day fun. Maybe it's your job your degree, your career. Maybe it's that boyfriend or that girlfriend that you're sitting next to. <laughs> but what is it? What, what is your anchor? I'll never forget years ago, there was a 25-year-old young man from New York and he had flown down to Miami for spring break and uh, he was playing in, at South Beach. He was playing in the edge of the water 
and uh, just playing there. And, and like a lot of people from the Northeast, he hadn't seen the sun in months. And he was just going like, wow, there's sun and blue sky. And he was diving into the water, but what he did not realize was that there was a sandbar there. And so he dove uh, and hit his head. It knocked him unconscious. It broke his neck and it took about 45 seconds for the lifeguards to get to him, to get him out. And by the way, 45 seconds of inhaling salt water is a very, very long time. Later that day after the accident, I got a call from a pastor friend in New York and he said, Greg, I need you to do me a favor. I need you to go to the hospital. There's this young man, he's a 25 year old young man who had this accident at South Beach and he's in the ICU at Jackson Memorial and I need you to go. Now, never forget the day, my, my wife and I drove to Jackson and we went up to the ICU unit. We walked in and his father was there and we began to talk to his father who obviously was distraught. And uh, I asked permission, I said, can I pray? And here was this body of this 25 year old young man laying on his back, his hands were kind of folded across his stomach and there were tubes and wires going everywhere. And I, I reached up and I, I grabbed his hands and I'll never forget the feeling of those hands. I mean, they were cold and clammy and I prayed. I prayed the best prayer that I knew to pray. And I prayed over this young man. And after we prayed, my wife and I walked out and she has a background in nursing and it was very clear the prognosis that this young man had. And I thought to myself, 25 years old, his entire life ahead of him, and this fluke accident on Spring Bank at the beach, and his entire life changed like that in an instant. And I was reminded of the words of the writer of Hebrews. He was writing to the church. He was writing to followers of Jesus. And he says these words in Hebrews chapter six, verse 19. He says this, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. Now, what's he saying? We, who's we? We, you know, from the context, he's writing to the church, he's writing to followers of Jesus, and he is saying we, as followers of Jesus, we have hope. He calls it this hope. And he's saying we have hope in Jesus. We have hope in the son of living, of the son of the living God that he can be an anchor, not just for our lives, but for the very core of us, for the soul. And he says that he will be an anchor that will hold, and how does he describe it? He says firm and secure. And what this metaphor is actually conveying is that no matter how chaotic your life gets, no matter how crazy the circumstances no matter who disappoints you or who betrays you or what accident happens or what the doctor says or what the economy does or who gets elected president or how disappointing the Jaguars continue to be. He says, there is one thing. He says, there is one thing in this life that you can count on, just one thing. All day long through the darkest night of the soul and that's if you're in a right relationship with Jesus if you're actively following him, if you are his disciple, if you are full of faith, the writer of Hebrews says he can be your anchor, the anchor for your soul. And he says, that anchor, friends, it's gonna hold. It's gonna be firm and it's gonna be secure. And so I ask you again, what is your anchor? Where does your loyalty lie? Now, if you've been tracking along, you know that we've been in this teaching series going through the book of Genesis, and we're going chapter by chapter, section by section, and we've been at this for the better part of a year, and we're in the final last two weeks. The first book of the Bible, Genesis, 50 chapters, and I don't have enough time, and I don't have enough words, and maybe not enough creativity to describe to you what happens in these 50 chapters, but it is a human story but it's also a God story. And there's beginnings and there's jealousy and there's murder and there's building up and there's tearing down and there's creativity and there's promise and hope. There's also death and destruction. There's covenant, there's deception, there's dreams, there's mountaintops and deep, deep valleys. There are great decisions made 
out of extreme faith and there are horrible, terrible decisions made out of self and pride. I, I don't even know that Bravo TV could show this. But here's the key point. As I've been sitting through this with you these last few months, going through the entire book of Genesis, there is one thread that I believe runs through the entire thing. There's, there's one rock, there's one anchor. And all of the key players, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, and all the other players, all the extras, right? They keep coming back to the same thing over and over and over again. And it first pops up in Genesis chapter 12. And God is talking to Abraham. And here's what he says, Genesis chapter 12, beginning in verse two. He says this, he says, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I'll make you famous and you will bless others. Look what he says. He says, I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. And he says, all the families on earth will be blessed through you. God's words to Abraham. It's a promise. It's a covenant. And a version of this promise, a version of this covenant, is all shows up throughout the book of Genesis over and over and over again. And there's this key line. All the families on the earth, everyone on the earth will be blessed through you. Everything that had happened, all the highs, all the lows, all the good, the bad, the ugly, the great decisions, the terrible choices, the twists and turns, the one thing that keeps coming back over is this promise, this covenant. It serves like a rock. It serves like a, an anchor. It holds this thing together. And so here we are in the final few chapters. In the last few weeks, we've been looking at this guy named Joseph and, and his father, Jacob. And we've been looking at his story, and it's powerful, it's relatable, it's practical, it's full of truth. And today, we're at the very, very end. And today, we're in Genesis 47, 48, and 49, three of the last four chapters in the book. And I'm not going to read all of that to you. You're You're welcome. But I want to look at just two scenes. I want to look at two scenes as we close out this book of Genesis. And the first scene comes from Genesis chapter 47, verse 27. Genesis chapter 47, beginning in verse 27. Let's look at this scene together. It says this. Meanwhile, the people of Israel settled in the region of Goshen in Egypt. So they've come down from Canaan. They're in Egypt. He says, there they acquired property. He says, they were fruitful and their population grew rapidly. Now, Jacob, who's the father of Joseph, it says that he lived for 17 years after his arrival in Egypt. So he lived 147 years in all, verse 29. He says, at this time, at, as the time of his death drew near, Jacob called for his son, Joseph, and he said to him, please do me a favor. Okay, this is weird. Put your hand under my thigh and swear that you will treat me with unfailing love and honor by honoring this last request. Do not bury me in Egypt. When I die, please take my body out of Egypt and bury me with my ancestors back in the promised land. So Joseph promised, I will do as you ask. And he reaffirms it. Swear that you will do it, Jacob insisted. So Joseph gave his oath and Jacob bowed humbly at the head of his bed. Okay, what's happening in this scene? Okay, Jacob, right, the, the father of Joseph, he's forcing Joseph to choose his loyalty, right? Is Joseph gonna be loyal to, to Jacob and the kingdom of God? Is Joseph gonna, gonna stay loyal to this promise, this Genesis 12 promise, this covenant, or is Joseph gonna be loyal to Pharaoh in Egypt, right? So Joseph's got this kingdom of God, kingdom of Egypt choice going on. And so there's this moment, right? In the kingdom of God, Genesis 12, the promise, the covenant, this great nation, blessing of all, everyone, all the nations of the earth will be blessed through you. There's something bigger and grander or, hey, dude, your family rejected you. you they sold you into slavery. I don't have any record of them coming to look for you. They left you, you went to prison, 
and, and you worked your way up, you kept building your way up, and now you rose to power, you're in second in command, you got everything you could ever want, you got all the money in the world, you got a wife, you got kids, you have ultimate power and authority, what else could you want? And so here's this moment, Genesis 47, it's a father and a son, they have this kind of under the thigh, kind of weird kind of moment but the key question that he's asking Joseph is, Jacob, hey, where does your loyalty lie? At the end of the day, at the end of my life, where, where are you gonna come down on this? What's going to be your rock? I mean, what is gonna be your anchor? And the reality is you and I have choices every single day. You and I have decisions every single day. Some of them are big, some of them are really small, but we have choices and we have decisions and how we make those choices and what decisions we make, they point toward our loyalty. Like what matters? What is important to you? What is important to me? What matters to us? And for Joseph, it was his kingdom language, kingdom of God, kingdom of Egypt? Are you gonna choose the promise, the covenant, this grander, bigger story, or man, are you just gonna take all of the good stuff that got in your lower story life? For you and me, I would probably frame it a little different. I would frame it in terms of discipleship. I would frame it, frame it in terms of this idea of following Jesus. See, at the core of Christ's church is our mission that comes out of Matthew chapter 4, 19, and says this. Jesus, he's looking at these fishermen, and he says, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Follow me, right, this idea of make disciples, and I will make you, this idea of a better disciple, being transformed by God, being changed from the inside out, becoming like Jesus, right? It's this process of changing and transformation. And the result of that is, he uses the term fishers of men. We, we would say more disciples or, or on mission with Jesus, doing what Jesus done. And so what is following Jesus? What, in simple terms, what does it mean to follow Jesus? Is, would say Jesus is my leader, Jesus is my teacher, or I could say it this way, Jesus is my rock, Jesus is my anchor. I choose to make Jesus the leader of my life. I choose to be his follower. I choose to be his apprentice. I am one of many who have found Jesus to be the most radiant life to ever grace the human scene. There is simply no better way, truth, or life to be found than that of Jesus. In fact, Dallas Willard would say it this way. He would say, there is no problem in human life that apprenticeship to Jesus cannot solve. So what does it mean to follow Jesus? Dallas Willard again, he says it this way. He says, the greatest issue facing the world today with all its heartbreaking needs is whether those who identify as Christians will become disciples Students, apprentices, practitioners of Jesus Christ, steadily learning from him how to live the life of the kingdom of the heavens into every corner of a human existence. Or John Mark Homer would say it this way, the greatest issue facing us today is not climate change or human rights or presidential election or border control or ongoing wars or the specter of nuclear war, as crucial as these are. But can you imagine how many of these problems would effectively be solved overnight if the billions of living humans who identify as Christians would actually become disciples of Jesus? I mean, what if the billions of people who actually claim to be Christians, what if their driving aim was to approach every challenge as Jesus would? The statistics tell us that about 63% of people in the United States claim to be a Christian, but only 4% identify as a disciple of Jesus. You see, Jesus is not looking for converts to Christianity. He's looking for disciples in the kingdom of God. So what is a disciple? 
A disciple is someone that's like, I'm gonna take my cues from Jesus. I'm gonna study him. I'm gonna seek him. I'm gonna abide in him. I'm gonna slow and walk with him. I'm gonna follow him. I'm gonna try to think like him and be like him and act like him. I'm gonna be with Jesus, become like Jesus, do as he did. I'm gonna try to follow him in a way that aligns my life, that sinks my life, that, that gets my life in step with the way that he thinks and the way that he acts. He is my driving aim. He's my rock. He's my anchor. Years ago, uh, I, I was living in Chicago, and um, I had a friend, and for some reason, uh, she, she bought a dog. And it wasn't just like a little puppy. I mean, it was like one of these big, like, lab, like a yellow lab, big dogs, like 75, 80 pounds. And she couldn't handle this dog. It was like, this dog was crazy dog. And it was too big, he was too big and too strong, and so she asked me, she said, hey, will you come and help me walk my dog? I can't, I can't walk this dog. And so I agreed, uh, I guess I'm a nice guy, but it's Chicago, it's freezing cold. Why would you live there? It's freezing cold, and I've got this crazy dog, right, and he's big, and he's active, and he's strong. And so after work, I would go to my apartment, and it was just around the corner, and I would, I would put this dog on a leash, and it was like a wild animal. And the way it began is how I see some of you walking around the neighborhoods. <laughs> it's like, I tell you, it's, my, it's my shoulder and socket, right? I mean, this is a big, strong dog. And it was not me walking the dog. It was the dog walking me. And it was very, very hard and very, very tense. And I would get back from a, a little walk around the block sweating profusely. It was like a wild animal. And there was so much fight in this dog. And, if, and God forbid if this dog saw a squirrel or another dog, it was all that I had to hold this dog from moving. But over time, what began to happen? Over time, we began to kind of figure something out here. And I'm no dog whisperer, what's that guy's name on Nat Geo? I don't know his name. But over time, the dog and I began to figure it out. And we began to figure out how to kind of do this thing. And the tension in the leash began to become less and less. And it was less of this and more of this. And over time, we learned how to kind of walk in step and to walk together. And after many, many months, there was even a time where we could walk and I would actually drop the leash. And I don't know if the dog knew it or not, but we were walking side by side and I had nothing connecting me to the dog. And that's a silly kind of story, but I believe God's desire for you and me is that we would just walk step in step that there'd be this alignment, that there would be this cooperation, that, that we would see God, that we would see Jesus. He is our guide, he is our leader. And that we were created for this bigger, grander story, that something bigger than me and bigger than you, that we were created for this and God wants that for us and he desires for you and for me to walk in alignment, to walk in step. And this is what discipleship is. This is what following Jesus is. But I realize in a room like this that we're all in different places. We're in different places in our faith. We're in different places in our journey. And some of you, you probably you're in here and maybe you're only here because somebody offered you free lunch. And maybe it feels like that tension, right? It's just like, it's tense. And your perspective of God and your perspective of Jesus is not very positive because it feels like a war and it feels like a tension. And he's just some cosmic God that just wants to smack you over the head with a ruler. And there's others of us who we want to follow Jesus. We really do. Like there's something in us, but, but it's hard. It's hard to let go. There's just some things that are enjoyable. There's some things that I enjoy to do and, and I, ju I just wanna keep kind of holding on to those and so I'll dip my toe in the Jesus pool a little bit but I really just wanna do that. There's others of us, we're, we're, we're in the room and we're just kinda, what's the minimum standard? Like what's I need, the, what's the free get out of hell card, give me that. And I'll just do the whatever the minimum standard I gotta do just to keep God from not being mad at me. The reality is none of us are perfect. And, and, and like the dog, if a cat or a squirrel or another dog or a shiny object, look, 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 look. But see, following Jesus, it's not about perfection. It's not about rules. 
It simply comes down to what? To heart. It comes down to this idea that, that our driving aim, that our, that our driving aim, that our loyalty, that our priority is, is following Jesus. And in Genesis 47, in this kind of weird moment between this father and this son, it's, it's kind of a recalibration moment. It's almost like a reset moment. And, and they're going through this, this ritual, this thigh under the, this hand under the thigh moment. But, but what they're really doing it's a moment of reaffirming the covenant, of reaffirming, of going back to the rock, of going back to the anchor. It's Joseph saying, not only am I gonna trust God, but I'll partner with him to bring his message to the world. I'll do this. All the nations of the earth will be blessed. So here we are. It's Palm Sunday. It's the start of Passion Week. And I would ask again, what is your anchor? What is that one thing? What is that rock? See, I wanna trust him. I want him to be my driving aim, to sink my life to his. Let's look at one more scene. In the final act here in Genesis 49, Jacob is gonna go through this kind of this whole ritual where he's gonna go through all 12 of his sons. And he's gonna say these words, it's kind of like a blessing, but some of them it doesn't really feel like a blessing because he tells them they're terrible. But he goes through all 12 of his sons and he says words and speaks over them right before he dies. And I just wanna look at one of these scenes. And it's, it's the fourth son, his name is Judah, and it's found in Genesis 49, beginning in verse eight. And so Jacob, He's going one by one through his sons. Here's what he says to Judah. Genesis 49, eight. Judah, your brothers will praise you. You will grasp your enemies by the neck and all your relatives will bow before you. Judah, my son, is a young lion that has finished eating its prey. Like a lion, he crouches and lies down. Like a lioness who dares to rouse him. Look at verse 10. Judah, the scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from his descendants until the coming of the one to whom it belongs, the one whom all nations will honor. So there's all kinds of interesting Im imagery here. There's all kinds of crazy backstory. You can see it in Genesis 38. You can see it in Matthew chapter one. But here's the key point. Here's what I want us to see today. What he's doing is he's saying, hey, the Genesis, Genesis 12, and the one, that, that promise, that covenant that keeps coming up all throughout the entire book, hey, the fulfillment of that promise, the fulfillment of the, all the families, everyone on the earth will be blessed, it's gonna come, and it's gonna come in a person, and his name is Jesus. He's the Messiah. The fulfillment of Genesis 12, the fulfillment of the promise, the fulfillment of the, of the covenant, the rock, the anchor, guess what? He's coming to you. You're not going to him. He's gonna come to you. All the families of the earth will be blessed to you is revealed in Jesus Christ. Jesus, the son of the living God. He's gonna come to you and he's gonna come to me. He's gonna take on human flesh. He's gonna live among us. He's gonna walk. He's gonna eat and sleep and experience all the things that we experience. He's gonna teach. He's gonna heal. But most of all, he's gonna love. And ultimately, he's gonna lead him to what we're gonna talk about this week or in Passion Week, to the cross where he's gonna take all your sin and all your junk upon him so that you and and I, not because of us, but because, because of him, can be in this right relationship with God. The fulfillment of the promise, the fulfillment of the blessing, the fulfillment of the covenant. He, the anchor, the rock, is coming to you. And so today, it's Palm Sunday, the beginning of the Passion Week. And I thought it would be appropriate here on Palm Sunday to go back quickly to the very first Palm Sunday found in John chapter 12, beginning in verse 12. It says this, the next day, the news that Jesus was on the way to Jerusalem swept through the city. It says a large crowd of Passover visitors 
that the city was swollen because of the Passover festival. It says that they, the large crowd of Passover, they took these palm branches and they went down to the road, the road that goes into Jerusalem to meet Jesus, and they shouted, and this is a quote from Psalms 118. It says they shouted, praise God or Hosanna. It really means kind of please save us. Hosanna, blessing on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hail to the king of Israel. Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessing to the one who comes in the name of the Lord. John tells us that Jesus found a, a young donkey on the, and he wrote, it, wrote on it, fulfilling the prophecy. That was from Zechariah chapter nine. Don't be afraid people of, Israel, of Jerusalem, look, your king is coming riding on a donkey's coat. And look what John writes in verse 16. This is what I love about John, by the way, is John is just kind of honest, and he kind of just, and so he, even if it makes him look bad, he's honest. Uh, look what he says, verse 16. It says, his disciples, he says, his disciples didn't understand at the time that this was a fulfillment of the prophecy. <laughs> oh, we missed it. <laughs> Duh. Right, John's like, I missed it, bro. His disciples didn't understand at the time that this was a fulfillment of the prophecy. But after Jesus entered into his glory, meaning after Jesus resurrected back to heaven, they remembered what happened and realized that these things had been written about about him. I love that. So here's this beautiful story, right? This Palm Sunday that kind of kicks off today, the, the Passion Week. And John's writing his, his eyewitness account of this. And I love that he writes the honesty of it. Again, it shows some of the authenticity of the text. And he's like, man, it was all happening and we missed it. We were like, what? And then like months later, years later, we were like, oh. And I love that because it's a picture of the human story. It's a picture of the discipleship journey later on. And so here's my invitation to everyone in the room as we start the Passion Week. Here's the invitation for me. Here's the invitation for you. What would it look like to have one of these moments like Jacob and Joseph had? A recalibration moment, maybe a reset moment. Slow down a minute. Life's flying. I'm coming off of spring break with the kids, I'm going back to school, all these crazy things are happening, but what does it look like for me to reset, to recalibrate? Where are you with Jesus? Is he really your anchor? Is he really your rock? Or have you drifted? And maybe, yeah, 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 bald guy, you're right, right, Jesus, but you really, you drifted. And something else, some other security, some other person, some other thing has become that. Where are you with Jesus? Because all the key players in Genesis, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, they were all over the place. I mean, it was a mess. And in this room, some of you are all over the place. It's a mess. But they kept coming back to this one thing. Maybe today you need to come back to this one thing. What is it that you're gonna make your anchor? What is your rock? Or maybe I could say it this way. What are you gonna do with Jesus? So here's the invitation this Passion Week. Is how are you as an individual? If you're a, a dad, how are you, how's you that are gonna lead your family? If you're a mom, how are you gonna lead your family? How are you going to engage Passion Week? We've created opportunities around here and, and the, all of the opportunities are to help you in your discipleship journey, is to help you take your next step on your faith journey. And there's opportunities around here that will be around here all week. Maybe some of you, you, you need to just create some moment, a moment this morning. Maybe you just need to kind of sit and think. And some of you, I see are even writing. And maybe you're just like, okay, God, where am I with you? And maybe you just need to recalibrate, reset. Maybe some of you just, you need to commit. Like, hey, I'm gonna engage the passion narrative. 
And I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna begin maybe in John chapter 12. John would be a great place. John chapter 12 through John chapter 21. And you can just read through, uh, just engage every day this week into the narrative and, and immerse yourself into the story of Jesus. Later this week, we'll have opportunity out at the lake out behind you. There'll be opportunities to, to a guided tour around the lake to, to reflect for yourself, maybe with your family. We'll have opportunities here on Good Friday. We'll have opportunities next weekend on Saturday and Sunday. What are you gonna do with Jesus? What does it look like for you to, to follow him, to align yourself, to be in step with him? We kind of just invite us into kind of a reflective moment, a moment of prayer. And what I wanna do is I, I just wanna guide us into a reflection moment with communion. And then I'm gonna pray and then the, the team will come up behind me. But I don't wanna rush this moment. For some of us, this is a, like one of the only moments in the week that we actually slow the RPMs down for just a second. And if you have the packet with you, I'll invite you take that out. But really, what is this? What, why did Jesus say, hey, church, as often as you gather together, do this, uh, celebrate communion, celebrate Lord's Supper, uh, as often as you gather, do this, why? To remember me, to celebrate me, to recalibrate, to reset. And so maybe this is a reset moment for some. So I just invite you into reflection, I invite you to confession, I invite you to focus. Jesus simply took bread and he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this to remember me. And then he took the cup and he said, this is my blood spilled out for you. Do this to remember me. And so I'm gonna kind of invite you at your own pace. <laughs> when you're ready, you can take the bread. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this to remember me. When you're ready, you can take the cup. This is my blood, which is spilled out for you. It's Jesus' way of kind of reminding you and reminding me of like, hey, I wanna be that anchor. I created you with so much purpose and meaning and that can only be found when you align in your sink. Let me guide, let me be that one. Don't drift. So I just wanna say a word of prayer over us. Again, some of you, I'm gonna invite you just to remain seated and reflect. At the end of the prayer, some of you maybe wanna stand up and, and our team is gonna lead us into a closing song. But let me just say a prayer over each and every one of you in this room. As a room full of people that you know, and every single person here, God, you, you gave your life for, you were calling, you were, you were drawing into this deep, followership of you. God, you, you, you have so much in store. And so God, I just, I pray that every single person in this room, God, would just feel and experience a fresh encounter with you today. God, that you would speak that whatever those barriers are and those doubts and whatever those walls and those who've got that, that tension, God, I pray that somehow you would break through that as only you can. That's your stuff. God, I pray that we wouldn't miss this opportunity today. I pray we wouldn't miss this opportunity this week to engage, to engage you, to engage your passion narrative, to engage Easter week, to engage what this really means. <laughs> Chocolate's great, Easter bunnies, whatever. God, but what does it really mean to the soul? He says, you said that, that you're an anchor to the soul and you are firm and secure. So God, I pray you'll be that for those who are suffering, those who are hurting. God, I pray you'll be that for every single one of us in this room today, God. May you be exalted, may you be lifted up. Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Your will be done right here, right now. I pray this, God, in the name of Jesus, amen. Again, if you wanna remain seated and reflect, feel free to do that. The rest of you, feel free to stand and we're gonna end with this song.
My Savior bled for me. My Jesus set me free. Look at the wounds that give me life. Grace flowing from his side. No greater sacrifice. What he's done. What he's done. All the glory. My future is heaven. I praise God for what He's done. Oh, yeah. Sing for the freedom He has won. Even death is dead and done. His life is overcome. Speak, say the name. If you want to connect or to give, make sure you hit the tags behind your chairs. And if you need prayer or would like to make the best decision of your life by giving your life to Christ, you can come right down here to the front. We thank you all so much for coming and we will see you next week.